Okay. All right. Uh, so you're going to start with some. Uh, yeah. Okay. I can start. Yeah. Just a th one thing about lambda rings and zeta functions. So I guess I'll share my screen. Can you just repeat what you said? You said what? One thing about lambda rings and zeta functions. Okay. So there's this guy, Rama Chandran, who wrote a paper about zeta functions and lambda rings and the big wit ring. And I already did one attempt to explain that to you. Right. Um, and the and that's the paper that you and Todd were looking at and talking about. Right. Yeah. So Todd and I are going to keep doing that. And okay. Uh, okay. And so, so I guess I'll just I, I, I guess I was gonna what I was gonna say, I guess at some point is <laughs> I think I do understand the big whip ring better than I used to. But anyway, sorry, go ahead. Uh-huh. Yeah, so so the overall idea that we're that I'm we slash I am pushing for goes something like this. So you start out with a a uh, two rig, and this is going to be what you call, it only needs to be what you call an absolute two rig. Say it again, it only needs that? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't need more co-limits than that. Say it again, it doesn't need more what? Co-limits than that only. Oh, oh, okay, I got mixed up. Yes, I mean, every absolute, 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 absolute yes. two rig is some kind of more fancy co <laughs> sorry every every yes. fancy two rig is of some sort is also an absolute two rig yeah so and and then there's this thing that ramachandran calls a zeta function or maybe a motivic zeta function uh, because he's doing the case where r is some two rig of called motives, but but the point of my uh, uh, stuff here is to like strip out fancy assumptions having to do with motives, and so we'll just start off with an absolute two rig, and then it's growth and degroup. Uh, just is it uh, uh, motives? Motives more towards the shallow end, or motives more toward the deep end, um, or indifferent. Um, you know, because I because I thought you know if it's motives toward the deep end, I thought you might have trouble even being sure that it is an absolute two ring. But over the um, shallow, you know, the shallow end, you can. Um, all the kinds of motives that I was explaining to you, where you start yeah. out with adequate equivalence relation. Yeah. And you may pick whether you're working with uh, like smooth projective varieties or maybe some more general kind of variety. Uh, all of those categories of motives that I described, they're all pretty easily okay. absolute two rigs. Okay, I, I, I may have to review that, but okay, that, but fair enough. And then you're going to take K R. Yeah, so that's this direct sum K theory. And and one of the things that Todd and Joe and I proved is that that becomes a lambda ring. Yes. Um, and so it be by abstract nonsense of some particular sort, it becomes a co-monad, a co-algebra for the big wit co-monad. So we get this map here. So W is the big, big wit. But, uh, the, but that is synonymous with being a uh, lambda ring. Yeah, so that's this. Nice fact that you can define lambda rings either as algebras of a monad or co-algebras of a 
Yes. Cool monad. So we get this. And just because Todd and I were slightly confused about it for a little while, I'll just mention that this is a this is actually a lambda ring map. Not merely a ring map. Uh, because because of the way common common. Yeah. 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 It's just uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, because let's, of the let's, go ahead. Yeah. So um so this is what Ramaj Chandran calls in a special case, calls something like a motivic zeta function. I'm massaging his ideas a little bit to make them nicer on it to be sure. Honest. Uh, so this is so this is so so I'm gonna call this thing just something like z or something like that for zeta function uh say it again he calls this this map yeah he calls this map a motivic zeta with function. motivic zeta function and what maybe i'll say a word about that about like i mean you may have given well you may have already given hints about this when I was following it not quite as well as now but uh i was trying to explain it and there are still things that I can't explain as well as I want, but but part of it is that I'll I'll say part of the idea. So like, so if we have um, if we have a I'll put it this way. It sounds a little bit funny, but if we have a two rig map. from R, I'll call it number, this two rig map, number assigned, going from R to the integers. So here I'm thinking of the, well, let's see, that's already, that's already probably a bad. Yeah, I'm uh, not sure yet what you mean by that. Yeah, uh, that's sort of a bad, sorry, this is like some other kind of two rig. Uh, <laughs> let's see, what do I wanna say? Maybe I'll say it like this. Yeah, let me just not, let me just not write it that way. Let's like if we have a, uh, do, 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 do. Let me uh, let me do it a different way. So let me say it like this. Let's say we have this map, and I guess I'm gonna weasel out of some problems by saying it's a map from k of r to the integers. And but but do you think it does or should have a uh, precursor at the level of the absolute two rigs? Yeah, it it should. Yeah. But do you know what the target should be? You know, <laughs> no. Uh, so I mean, I'll tell you what the idea should be. So the, yeah, the idea should be that that any object in R should have something that we could that acts like a number of points. Uh, and the number could be negative for motives. For varieties, it's always non-negative. So that's why I'm using Z here. Well, that, that, that's why. That's one reason why we why we want to use Z. So you really did meet, Well, let's see. Uh, that's how so what I guess what I'm trying to say is that there should be there should be this precursor map, and I I'm sinking into all the things that I didn't want to talk about because I don't understand them. I guess, but it's okay. So. So there's like, there's some kind of map from the two rig to Z. So, so you're really thinking of Z as a discrete two rig, a discrete absolute two rig. Is it is, it is absolute, is that right? Yeah. I mean, is it an absolute two rig? Uh, I was trying to think, it's, it's certainly, it's like a rig, a discrete rig category in like the Kelly LaPlaza sense. Um, I don't know if it's- but, but you mean discrete, right? As a, as a yeah, category? Yeah, it's just objects, no, Nothing but identity morphism. So I mean, you almost got me thinking that maybe it is then. Uh, abs uh, absolute two two rig. Uh, I guess you might have to puff it up a bit to make it be um, 
ab enriched? No, I guess I could just have zero. To, uh, oh, have oh, like one. oh, oh, so there's the issue of whether it's ab enriched. Oh, okay, I forgot about that. Well, I guess it could be if it's discrete. I guess uh, it just has like a, a zero abelian group for any Hans set. Well, no, it would be the unit abelian group for every endo Hans set. And for the non endos, it would be zero. Okay. <laughs> and. Uh, huh. Well, uh, okay. Well, I got myself pulled into something here. Uh, let me just think. Let me just think about that for a second because there's okay. what? There's zero and one are the item potents in those things. And that is probably just the empty something and the. <laughs> that, that might actually work. Uh, <laughs> because there are not many item potents in in the unit abelian group. Yeah, yeah, so and they're just you know yeah. very vanilla ones. They're you know like the empty thing and the full thing. So uh, I can't guarantee that it works, but it sort of looks like it might work. But okay, well, this is a good thing for me to try to to do okay. because I'd like to do as much as I could up at the two rig level just for the usual reason of wanting to take the high ground uh but yeah so i'll have to i'll have to think about that um i don't think <laughs> oh it's uh, it's actually very tricky it's actually very tricky Maybe you should <laughs> use the escape route. It might okay, I'm going to use the escape route for now anyway. Okay. Why is it very tricky? Well, because the zero object, uh, it seems like that wants to have its endomorph. It's, and the identity map of the zero object sort of seems like it wants to be both one and zero. But I, I could be wrong about that. Um, okay. Anyway, so I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to go way, way down to some low level thing. So, uh, so I'm just going to say like, if we have a ring map from here to here, I wish it was something more like a Lambda ring map, but, but I'm not even sure if it is. Okay. So what this is supposed to be is it's supposed to be assigning to any Variety, its number of points, and then more generally, um, any motive, its number of quote number of points. It could possibly be negative, and that's supposed to just get along well with with uh, co-product and uh, tensor product of motives. So if the motive so if the motive does come directly from a variety, then it's just counting the number of points of the variety. Yeah, that's right. And we're like maybe like working with varieties that were a fixed finite field and counting the number of points. There. All right, all right, all right. Think about that, but go ahead, yeah. So anyway, if we have such a thing, then we can do this trick where we like take the, the general motivic zeta function i mean i'm sorry i'm just calling it the motivic zeta function this thing that i defined up here and just compose it with uh with i guess w of w of number of points and that goes to k so this goes to W of Z. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it goes to the big win, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, the. So. So then this. Well, as I'll say in a minute, the elements of the big wit ring you can think of as formal power series. There's some subtleties about yes. how you do that. But, so, but then so there's the, some subtleties about what about? But how you do that. Okay, okay, fair enough. Which I will 
I'm glad to discuss that's sort of part of what I'm really trying to discuss actually, but but the, just to like get you going in the right direction. So but did, well, did you mean more subtleties about what the elements are, whether they generally are the formal power series, or do you mean how you add and multiply them together and what the uh, lambda operations are? All, all of those, all okay. of those things potentially, and even things that I don't want to say until I actually say it. Okay. But but, the, but this is like the crude outline, so that so that then we get a map from K of R to some formal power series, and those power series will be zeta functions. And there'll be zeta functions of the type that people like to use when they're working over like a fixed local product. zeta functions. What? Local, local zeta functions. Right, local zeta functions, yeah. So they're- Right, I think that's what we're yeah. expecting. Or yeah. I was expecting for some reason. Go ahead, yeah. Yeah, so that's, so that, So this thing here is like, is it, is it gonna be like a zeta function? A sort of more familiar looking to some people type of zeta function. Um, so you can see that we've watered down the, the zeta function I've been calling big Z. Yes. By comp post composing it with this thing that's sort of a method of counting points. Um, so one of the things that was confusing me about this Todd resolved in our last conversations. And this confusing thing is that there are always two really interesting ways to think of an element of a, of a big wit ring as formal power series. So the two very nice ways to to do it, and so is it. It's not like it's not like lambda operations versus Adams operations, is it? I was that might be like a third one, but I was thinking okay. of Adams operation. Sorry, lambda operations versus sigma operations. Okay, symmetric tensor powers. So say it again, what did you say? Metric tensor powers. Symmetric. Symmetric tensor power. Symmetrized tensor. Okay, so these are very uh, mirror symmetric ways of uh, thinking of it as formal power series. Right. So, so like one one example of this business is if you take the the free lambda ring on one generator. Sorry, a really silly question. That's uh -huh. that uh -huh. sigma. That's a long-standing convention right. for for the uh, symmetric ones. Um, I don't actually know how. Okay. So we were just doing like lower. We, unlike you, we are able to sure. use lowercase sure. letters, and so we use like uppercase lambda and s for exterior and symmetric powers as like actual functors and then like lowercase them all for these things. And so I have not actually seen people discuss sigma operations too much. Um, okay. So, yeah. So like, so part of what's going on here is that, which you sort of know, I guess, is that, so this is like the free sigma ring on one generator. Yeah. It's a free lambda ring. Huh? Yeah, sorry. It, by the way, it's terrible that like a sigma ring is like something from measure theory that's like completely oh. unrelated. Uh, right, uh, right. No point. Well, but I, th I think it's, I've gotten horribly confused between lambda calculus and lambda ring. <laughs> okay, and then there may be a sigma calculus and sigma rings. So, yeah. Is that what's called lambda calculus? Yeah, that's the Cartesian closed okay. category thing. <laughs> okay, I have not attempted yeah. to relate the lambda calculus to lambda, and I'm not gonna. I mean, I, 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 I certainly can't guarantee that there aren't relationships, and also there's probably a relationship with the sigma range too. There is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, so so one common description of the 
of the free lambda ring on one generator. There are many common descriptions. Sometimes they're called symmetric functions. Uh, but one way to think about it is it's polynomial ring in these lambda operations, which, right, are, are you comfortable with this? Comfortable with what? With just thinking of lambda as free on these? Yeah. Yeah. The free ring on on count of yes. yes. lambda. Yeah. Yes. So, okay. Yes. So then, well, so just uh, let me think about that. Yeah. Okay. And then the lambdas are hidden in there in some funny way by producting. Sorry, the sigmas are hidden in there? Oh, I'm sorry. Those are the lambdas. Oh, okay. I thought you were yeah. writing down in terms people of. Usually, people usually, people usually. I think I, I might people often write this, and I've never seen them write it in terms of the sigma operations, but probably someone has. Maybe they just don't call them sigma operations. I mean, there are all these different uh, bases, and there are all these different symmetric functions that people like to discuss. And I guess probably there's there's a famous bunch that are the way they think of the sigma operations. I can never remember these names, like elementary symmetric functions and yeah. other, yeah. yeah, anyway. Yeah. But I don't want to get into those yeah. <laughs> descriptions. Yeah. But yeah, so so like. So, so yes, we're agreeing the sigmas are hidden in there somewhere. Yeah, the sigmas are hidden in there. By taking and, products and stuff. Yeah, like and, and, I, and I told you last time. And all the young diagrams are hidden in there, yeah. Okay. Yeah, they're all, in, they're all in there. So I told you last time that there's this like, involution yes. of, of here that's mapping yes. the lambdas to the sigmas and therefore vice versa. So it's yes. an automorphism. Basically just reflecting the Young diagrams around the main axis or something. Right, yeah. So that's a, a ring automorphism. I believe it's not a lambda ring automorphism. Sounds uh, like it shouldn't be, yeah. Yeah. So, so, but because it's a ring automorphism, that means that we can also write uh, I, we can also write uh, lambda as a free commutative ring on all these sigma operations. Yes, yes. Yeah. So that second one description is seems to be the one that uh, we need now. Uh, and so okay. So one so one thing that gives us is a way of I may have to do some stuff. Nope. So so one way thing that, that gives us is whenever we have like a lambda ring Whenever we have a lambda ring, it's a co-algebra of this big wit co-monad, but we can sort of yes. try, try to like get a kind of con concrete formula for this, this uh, co-unit map. And I guess the way it works is that we, we say, oh, this, what is this big wit thing? So you can think of it as like hom. Yes. Lambda. Yes. The A. This is, I guess, um, uh, um, lambda ring. Wait. <laughs> now, this is ring homomorphisms. Ring homomorphisms. Let me just let me just say that. Let me just not write home. Let me just say what I'm talking about here. Uh, I think that's right. Yeah. Uh, can, can I think about that one? Let's see. The yeah. big wit ring. Okay. Yeah, I guess it's right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's something you can do to any ring. So it. So writing a lambda ring here would not even make sense. Uh, uh, but this map here will exist when A is a lambda ring. So. So this isomorphism works for any ring, meaning commutative ring. 
in this co-unit map exists when you have a co-algebra of, of W, I, E, a lambda ring. Sorry, this is the A points of the spectrum of the commutative ring lambda. Yeah. Okay. So then we're gonna, so then, so then one thing we can do is like explicitly write lambda as a free ring on a bunch of generators. And then you have two choices here. Right. And that's, that's sort of what was confusing me. Uh -huh. Okay. Because uh, you get like different concrete descriptions of what's going on in this same uh -huh. abstract situation, depending on what you pick. But we're going to pick this slightly less fashionable uh, generators of the sigmas. And so, yeah. So then, okay, so, so how does this map, how does this map from A to its big wit ring actually go in these, in these terms? So the way it goes is that, well, so for starters, ring maps from, from this polynomial ring to A are the same thing as like infinite sequences of elements of, of A. Yes. Where each of these guys goes. But then we can just for fun express that as a, as a power series, as a series of kind of, yeah, a formal power series. So what we do is we, and what are these coefficients? Well, you take the, you take your sigma operations and you apply them to the element of A and then you like multiply by some thing like T to the N here, which is just a place keeper for the formal power series way of thinking about things. So in other words, what I'm saying is that like you can you can know the lambda ring structure of A if you know what all the sigma operations do to an this element to an any element of A. And here they're all being kept track of in this in this format. Yeah. So this is the so this is the way that, um, so this is my explanation of what Ramachandran is, is doing when he's trying to write his uh, motivic zeta function in terms of the big wit ring. So, so well, maybe just like putting all the pieces together. So we had this motivic zeta function for any absolute two rig. I'm still just calling it a motivic zeta function just to sound cool, but it's, it's just a, it's uh -huh. a thing you get for any absolute two rig. And then, and then you, if you write it out in this style of, uh, of description of the of the big wit ring, then you get something like this Z will eat like a eat a motive, i.e. eat an object. Now I'm changing my tune a little bit. I hear A is some object in our two rig. And it has an equation. Equivalent, it has an equivalence class with its class in the growth and deep group. And then what the sigma operations really are doing in this particular case is they're just symmetrized tensor powers. So writing it in a very James Dolan-ish style. Uh -huh. 
well, actually, well, we'll be here. Okay. Sorry, ben. Yeah. So we get, so we get something like this. And then if our mode, and then if we're doing the case of motives, there's some motives that are just varieties or coming from varieties. And then this tensor power is just like a Cartesian power of varieties. I mean, there, there's a yeah. monoidal functor from varieties uh -huh. to motives that turns the Cartesian products of varieties into the tensor products of motives. So you could, you just are getting these things here, which when A is a variety, is just to symmetrize tensor power of the variety. I was another thing. So anyway, that that's what this is the formula that Ramachandran writes down. And so there's like something that I haven't done here, which is I like haven't said like why is this thing, or to what extent is this thing connected to more familiar kinds of zeta functions of like more familiar local zeta functions. Um, so well, that's. Well, I mean I mean, one of the things I really want to do here is I do want to check. I mean, as I say, you've been working with the lambda and sigma viewpoints, but I really want to check on the Adams viewpoint to, at, you know, when I go home to see yeah. if it's to see to see if what I was guessing is really matching now, meshing with what uh, with what you're saying now. It almost looks like it is the same thing, but I but I need to go home and check. Yeah, that would be great. Be yeah, I mean there are obvious reasons why we want to get the atoms operations into the yeah because they're connected to Frobeniuses, which is a, like a commonly way, used way of thinking about uh, yes. zeta functions, local zeta functions. Yes. Um, there's another. This is just another technical little nitpicky thing which is that i was like like if you have a variety like v is a variety i was trying to make sure that it's symmetrized tensor sorry symmetrized cartesian powers are they varieties and they're pretty much are I think they are so far it's sort of it's sort of funny because I see lots of people saying stuff like, well, it's not usually smooth, it's smooth when v is one dimensional but but the, the, but the uh, 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 sure, but the, is there any reason they have to be smooth? Is that part of what you know by variety or something? No, 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 what I was going to say is that these people who say like it's not necessarily smooth. They don't come out so far. I haven't found many people who come out and say it's a variety. So uh, it's sort of, I mean, maybe it means it must be a variety or they wouldn't say it wasn't smooth, but I would feel. Well, can you say anything about what you might, you know, what, what your worst fears are about how it can fail to be a variety? I mean, you know, there's Cartesian product of varieties and there's, it's the quotient stuff that I don't feel I understand quotient as well. Like, for example, I would like it to be true that if you had like, I mean, this is like asking for more than I need, but I would like it to be true that if you had like a finite group acting on a variety. Yeah. There was like a quotient that was a variety. And then, well, and I of course- I that is some famous, very easy thing. Uh, okay. I don't- I have the yet. nature of finite group actions. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, I just haven't found people come out and say that. So here we only need it for permutation groups. And okay. for there, I think it should basically follow because like the only bad thing that could happen happens sort of locally when a bunch of points or two or more points collide and you can look at like you can you can look look well okay sorry i'm, I'm working with c to the end but I, I should really be doing this over finite fields or all sorts of fields or something but but anyway 
I mean, I'm, you and I, I guess, are both really familiar with the case of like C to the N over N. Yeah. Or sorry, C to the K, a vector space, to the N over N factorial, which is some kind of, well, well, we're familiar with some things like that. <laughs> I guess we're very familiar with C to the N over N factorial, which is like when you're studying like roots of, of polynomials <coughs> and and like vial, vial group of the AN. C. Yeah, there's something like that. Yeah, but that, anyway, so, Anyway, I, I actually did my, so probably I should stop worrying because I did manage to find someone say, so on an offhand comment that if V is a quasi projective variety, then this is a quasi projective variety. Yeah, that seems very reasonable. So anyway, but I just realized that like, I don't know enough about co-equalizers of, of varieties. Like when, when, what can you mod out by and get a variety? So I was just like a little less thing for myself to straighten out. But it seems to be like almost implicit in this, all this stuff that I've been talking about here that that should work. So that's like a little technical thing that would just be good for me to, I would feel happy if I knew it. <laughs> are these, are you always working with varieties over a field? Um, I think I am, <laughs> yeah. I think the, I think the, the, those quotients you're wondering about, I think those are really well behaved over a field, but don't trust me on any of these. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. So you're giving with one hand and taking away with the other. Okay. Yeah. Well, it could be characters with zero. <laughs> sorry, sorry, which would not be what you would want. Um, okay. Yeah. Anyway, so so where this leaves off is like apart from the little mopping up operations, the next thing for me to do would be to uh, explain, which I'm not gonna do today, uh, but sometime understand and explain why this thing is, is, a, is a zeta function, is a local zeta function and some other some other sense of the term. So I, I'm done. Okay. 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 Um, yeah, I'm not sure I have anything to say about lambda rings at the moment, but I should. At some point, try to say a lot more about it. Um, yeah, I, I guess I won't really try to say anything about it right now. Um, okay. I'm well, gonna no, say, I'll, I'll just say one very unrigorous thing. What were you going to say? What were you going to say? I was about to. Are you done with this stuff? Can I? Can the, you clear it off? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, yeah, why? What, you don't have to erase the board or anything, but... No, I just want to get rid of it. Oh, okay. Um, what was I going to say? Well... So this is more, this is way more in the nature of questions and wondering out loud than it is in the, in the way of statements, than it is in the nature of statements. So... Um, So, in some sense, lambda rings is all about K theory and the categorification of K theory, uh, categorification in a very straightforward sense, 
but um, but also maybe it's sort of like the pre-categorification of um, K theory uh, that before you try to reconstruct a category of a, a, a two rig whose K theory you're taking, um, you sort of pre-categorify it. You identify these uh, lambda operations that exist at the decategorified level. Or something like that. Uh -huh. That's vaguely what I mean by pre-categorification. And, and I'm sort of suspecting it's related to Todd's general philosophy of trying to sort of decategorify, or for example, take K theory at a level of some theory. Uh, or two theory or something like that. Um, like which one, for example? Like what? Like which one, for example, or what's well, the- Well, I, I just mean, I, I, so I, 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 you know, I have the vague impression that Todd's philosophy and I, I mean, maybe it's, I, I don't know if Todd's the right one to uh, blame for it, but t Todd's philosophy that the whole notion of Lambda ring can maybe arise. La la right, the, the whole idea that right, that you could try to think of. Does it make sense? I was going to say something like that. You know, there's a two plethory, and you sort of decategorify it into a plethory, uh, and you try to establish the lambda plethory as an example of that, or something like that. Um, yeah, by the way, in our paper, we wanted yeah. to decategorify any two plethory of some sort and of get some a sort, yes, plethory, but we it started getting hard, sure, and so we switched to just doing the case, sure, of where we get lambda as a plethory, sure, sure, yeah, and there's something, yeah, at the moment, it's feeling like there's a very Bootstrapish example there, but anyway, um, what was I trying to say? That uh, lambda rings. The whole concept of lambda ring has a lot to do with K theory, some kind of K theory. Um, Right. Maybe it's more like algebraic K theory, but it's related in a lot of ways to kind of uh, topological K theory. And topological K theory is more than one kind of topological K theory, but some kind of topological K theory is an example of a, um, of a complex oriented cohomology theory, the, the kind of thing that happens in Quillen's formal group blogging. Uh -huh. um, and I'm sort of wondering about the general overlap of those ideas here. So what I mean is you know if you work with some other famous complex oriented cohomology theory, Could there be something like a plethory associated with that, or you know, what extra? Uh -huh. are, are there special cases, or is there some intermediate between special and general case where that happens? Um, again, it sounds like it has something to do with the way that K theory is meaningful both in a topological context and an algebraic context. I don't know, I'm just thinking about it out loud about this as I'm talking about it. Um, yeah, I was trying Yeah, to take a bunch of stuff I was trying to learn, like yeah. the Reed Rock theorem uh, yes. stuff and try to massage it into some framework where you had a two rig and it had its K theory, or it's a growth and D group, but then you also, it also had some kind of ordinary cohomology group. 
And then there's like a churn character map from the growth and deep, from the K theory to the ordinary cohomology. Uh, but I, I didn't get too far yet um, because for starters, I don't really know how you would define the ordinary cohomology of a, of a two rig. And I don't really know exactly like when, maybe what extra structure you need to be able to define that. Um, but there, there's- Yeah, that sounds like the same, roughly the same kind of thing I was trying for. I, I mean, I, was ha I, I, I didn't completely hear everything you said, but I heard a lot of what you said. And yeah, I was thinking about similar ideas, but go ahead, yeah. Yeah, so f I think it's like Fulton and, and Lang, Serge Lang had some book called Riemann Rock Algebra. Yes. Where they were trying to like yes. isolate out the some bare bones ingredients necessary to have to do what I was saying basically to have like a cohomology group, ordinary cohomology groups of something, and then like K theory groups of something, and the churn character map from one to the other, and then like show that they, you could get a Riemann Rock formula from this. So, so they're trying to like generalize some sure. known argument to the, this more abstract case. Uh, yeah. And it, the book looks pretty interesting. Uh, yeah. I feel like it should be polished up and made nicer, but also in addition to that, um, apparently it has a bunch of mistakes in it. And so if you read about it, or if you read about this book, Hi, John. Hi. if you read about it, you find people saying like, ah, it's hopeless to try to get anything out of this book because this, because there's like major mistakes early on in the book that would have to like require the whole book to be rewritten somehow, not easily. So anyway. That's interesting. Okay. Um, so maybe, let's see, what time is it now? It's uh, 2 45. Six, and we're going to try to go to 6 30. Yep. Um, so maybe I'll start talking about uh, children's drawings now. Um, okay. So let me try to, let's, yeah, so let me try to get the screen here. And um, so how do I do that? Share screen. Okay. And um, all right. So I did, uh, so, you know, I guess actually after our scheduled starting time today, I sent you an email where I um, just sketching out some vague ideas about what I can talk about now. Um, the um, well, I've been telling you a bit about Abelian Desan Dunfan for children's drawings, whatever. Um, and I might tell you a little bit more about that, just try to understand how they work. Um, but I'm also very tempted to tell you about um, real children's drawings. Um, I'm sort of thinking out loud here about which I should talk about. Let, uh, I didn't. I didn't yeah, really I didn't. get. I didn't really get that Kagami lattice stuff. Yes. At the end last time, that is, I was like nodding. Uh, because I got the tiny bit of it, but I don't actually see like right where you get this particular Kagame lattice. Right. Form. I mean, one of my theories at the moment is that if we just act out an example or, or two, or even just an example, um, that might help. Uh, mm -hmm. And yeah. um, so just checking my notes here. Um, So yeah, let's try. Um, 
let's let's try some examples here. So uh, let's see. So how do I do this? Um, uh, I guess I'll start drawing the Kagome. How do you, Kagome? <laughs> you don't have any ideas about the true pronunciation, do you? Uh, well, I know that just Japanese is supposed to like have no, no more stress on any syllable. Okay, okay, so Kagome, okay. Uh, so let's see, so. Uh, Right. This is this is the part where I wish I had a hexagonal lattice instead of a cubic lattice. Um, <laughs> you're in a good approximation for the square root of three over two. Let's see. Um, Just trying to draw equilateral triangles here. Let's see. Um, Yeah, that's right, let's see, and some reds. No, sorry, sorry, so those are supposed to be reds. Reds, reds, reds. Is that really right? Yes. Um, and red, red, and so let's go. What does this look like? There's like hexagons and stuff. And something like this. Something like this. How much of it do I really need? All right, and somewhere in there, there's the thing we'll treat as the origin. Uh, so, can you say where this thing is coming from? Like, how? What would? What would be some mathematical simple reason why we would draw this thing? Well, because it's really related to the abelianization of the um, rotation group over here. You know, we have this coxeter die, this coxeter tessellation, coxeter tiling. Can you just remind me what the coxeter group is for that one? Yes. It's, uh, well, first of all, let me just draw in a little bit of coloring here. One, two, three, one, two, three, yeah, okay. 
one, two, three, one, two, three. I guess it goes like that. One, two, three. Okay, and then blue. One, two, three. So th this is the, this is the one with you know all the labels are infinity. Um, uh huh. Okay. You know, so it's like. Uh, So because all the labels are infinity, all of the <clears throat> vertexes are cusps, I think. I think that's a plausible causality, causation thing. Um, you know, so rotating around anything is infinite order. That's what was making these things be cusps that, you know. Uh -huh. And um, so this is like some card graphic group some actually this one isn't cartographic this is just i don't know this is the most okay vanilla coxeter group in, it's an extreme coxeter group in some sense just you know the no label information no constraints yeah. okay so uh -huh. yeah sorry. Um, you know it's just free on three involutions and the index two subgroup the rotations is just uh free on two generators yeah um okay so then you're gonna by the way it is interesting to consider like what happens if you have you know four colors instead of three colors and a lot of the patterns continue and then you get like three-dimensional cargo many stuff but what are you saying so then you're gonna abelianize that Yes, abelianize only the rotation stuff. It's too extreme. If, if you abelianize the whole reflection group, it just becomes uh, a two element set. It collapses down to just, you know, odd versus even. Um, whereas if you just abelianize the rotations, then it becomes, you know, free. I, I might have said that wrong, right? I said it collapses down to uh, to to just two elements, but it actually co collapses down to eight elements, I guess, right? The free abelian group on two on three elements of order two. Um, so yeah, it, it collapses out. That, it collapses down to something very. Uh, very small, if if we uh -huh. Uh -huh. if we abelianize the whole reflection group, but if we just abelianize the rotation part of the reflection group, then it's the free group on two generators. And you can see, right, the Kagome lattice has this. Uh, you can clearly see that it has this symmetry of the. Free thing on two generators. So, um, right, what? So, okay. <laughs> so, I still can't draw a really nice picture of the abelianization of this rotation group. Um, but, but you can at least imagine it, right? So, we're going to have a correspondence between the abelianized version of this thing over here and this thing over here, okay? So let's, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, I'm sort of marked a sort of base triangle in the uh, left-hand picture. Let's just mark a base triangle, the obvious one in the right-hand picture. But you're supposed to imagine that, you know, that we, uh, we abelianized the thing on the right, okay? Uh -huh. So, um, so there's a correspondence between the the B and I thing on the right and the thing on the left. And the correspondence goes like this, that the cusps over here go to the straight lines over here.
and the um, edges between cusps, every edge goes between two cusps. Those correspond to, um, those correspond to uh, intersections between straight lines. Uh-huh. And um, triangles uh, you know the, the let's say the small triangles over on the uh, I mean maybe maybe I shouldn't even say small triangles. Maybe I'll just say triangles, I guess. But the, the, the sort of visible hyperbolic triangles there, uh -huh. they correspond to the, the triangles over here. But they correspond in a funny way. So right over on the right hand, hand side, a, a triangle has corners that are cusps. But the cusps over in the right hand picture correspond to straight lines on the um, on the left hand side. So the what, 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 I guess we're saying that the triangle corners on the right hand side correspond to the triangle sides on the left hand side. Uh-huh. So we're just trying to set up this dictionary. Do I dare ask what the hexagons on the left correspond to? Oh, uh, <laughs> I well, know that you weren't wanting to say that. I, I, I can I can tell you. So, uh, you, you, well, so, so so first of all, in the world of Coxeter tilings, people talk about galleries. You know, you just think of the tiles as chambers. Maybe that's what they some original or maybe non-original people they call the the tiles. They call them ga uh, chambers. And then you imagine a path, you know, walking through chambers, that's called a gallery or something like that. So it's a path of, of chambers, a path of tiles. And um, so these hexagons that you're talking about over on the left-hand side, that's like a circular gallery of six chambers. Uh, you know, it's like, let, let me just, you know, you walk, you walk from this chamber to this chamber, 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 to this chamber and then you come back. Um, so, so there's, a, the, so this, there must be a corresponding gallery, circular gallery, circular circumference six gallery over in the right hand picture as well. But it could be a higher order. Gallery. It could be a longer gallery that gets mapped down to something. Short. Well, it has to be because there are no circular galleries <laughs> at all in the right. Well, hand side. It's just a tree. That's what. Yeah. So, that's the, what so there are no loops. You know, it's it's the. Right. You said circular gallery, but okay, not so circular. Yeah. Right, but what I meant was that it's a circular in the abelianization on the right hand. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm, sure. So so you don't see that it's. So you know. So I'm saying if 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 you take the commutator subgroup. Uh, that you mod out by to, um, to to get the abelianization over in the right-hand picture, you'll find that the shortest galleries that get you from the identity to some other commutator, those shortest galleries are length six. Oh. And those correspond to these hexagons or something like that. Um, so I, that so that was an attempt to ask, ask your question, uh, answer your question about what the what the. Uh, Can I also yeah. think about like an infinite gallery at right that like keeps on going on and on, and then it maps over to something that loops around every six time over the left. Uh, let me think about that. Um, so, okay, you're talking about rotating around a cusp, the infinite rotation around a cusp. 
I guess that's what I'm, what's making me guess that, yeah, is that there's some sort of obvious infinite galleries at right. Yes, and, and, and those are infinite galleries at left. Oh. Uh, you, want, you want me to show you what those are? Okay. So, um, 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 let me think, let me think. <laughs> so, okay. So the lines that have the red and blue dots on them, they, those are going, you know, very roughly. It's, it's like north by northwest to south by southeast. Yep. Um, those are, that, that's rotation around a green cusp. So in fact, I mean, really, right, really you should, uh -huh. re <laughs> Uh, sometimes I do a better job of having the edges and the vertexes both be tricolored in both pictures. Um, and, and that's helpful in understanding the correspondence, right? The way I have it set up here, it's like, you know, I just have the vertexes being colored in the left-hand side and the vertexes just being colored in the right-hand side. But, but that means different things are being colored in the two pictures. So. You know what I mean? Just think of the, you know, the, the anti-colors that, you know, if, if something is blue and green, think of that as red. If it's uh -huh. blue and red, yeah. think of it as green, et cetera. So um, it, it's these lines, these north by northwest, south by southeast, those are the ones that would be colored green. Those correspond to the green cusps. So, th so that is, um, that's the infinite gallery that you get by rotating around a green cusp. So, is it right? You, is it, you know, I mean, you know, let me just emphasize it again. There's that one, there's that one, there's that one. It just keeps on going infinitely. Uh huh. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, so, so, you know, so I, So, you know, so this is drawn in some funny way. This is drawn in some funny way. Uh, right, there's a, there's a funny cryptic aspect between the left-hand picture and the right-hand picture. And you might ask, why didn't I just draw it in the uncryptic way? But the picture gets very complicated, or at least I don't know a good way to draw it if you try to draw it without this cryptomorphism trick. I mean, what, what it ends up looking like something like is you have, uh, a you you have a bunch of uh, green vertexes, and you have an infinite sequence of, of green vertexes. You have an in, infinite sequence of blue vertexes. Sorry, that's supposed to be blue. And you have an infinite sequence of red vertexes. And then you, you know, there's your favorite triangle in the middle, like that or something like that. And then there are other triangles near it, but they're sort of It's folded up. It's like pleated like an accordion in a funny way that I can't really, you know, the next triangle is like, you know, if you change the blue, you get a, a, this, this triangle that goes behind that one. Uh -huh. Maybe I should have drawn it behind or something like that, like that, that, and then. And the whole thing is, is folded up and I don't have a good picture of it. But if you just think of it in this abstract way, it's just this Kagome picture. Uh, uh -huh. So, um, okay. Anyway, I think I sort of like it better now. Okay, okay. So, uh, you know, let's try to, 
act out some one example here of a, of a you know a, 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 a finite abelian children's drawing. So uh, um, let's 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 try to make some simple example here. So let's see. So I'm trying to say. So how does this work? Let's see. Uh, three. Yeah. So let's let, let's 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 try to say that. Um, let's try to say that. Rotation around. So right to give a children's drawing, we have to give an, an action of the free group on two generators here, right? Mm -hmm. on a finite set and um, so let's take uh, in a way this is a very simple degenerate example but 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 let's take uh, the set permuted set being permuted to be three elements a b and c and for rotation around any of the three colors uh, over, over in the right-hand picture, let's say, um, let, let's have it be uh, just um, advancing one step in the alphabet. So those, you know, the, all the permutations are the same. So of course they all commute with each other. So it's an abelian children's drawing. And that would correspond to, let me see if I can write that, what that one would be over here. So that'd be like A and up here, it would again be A. No, sorry, I said that wrong. This should be B, right? Where we're supposed to go one letter through the alphabet. So Right, this is just a, a reverse triangle. So, right, it's just a reflected triangle. To, if you have to do it twice, you have to go to here to get the the rotation. So it's A goes to to to, to B, and then and and also down here would be C. So you know, just along here, it's like C A B, and it would be the same thing sliding along the. B direction. So yeah, this is rotating. This direction is rotating. It looks like it's translation, but it's actually rotating in the according to the cryptomorphism. This sliding in this direction is rotating around the green. Sliding in this direction is rotating around the red, I think. And rotating in this direction, yes, is sorry, sliding in this rightward direction is rotating around the blue cusp in the right hand picture so it would be you know a b and c and here would be a and b and c so i think that all works if you, you see that this 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 periodic pattern gives you uh a very simple example of an abelian child's drawing. So this is also a, this is a very simple example of a period of a of a of adding of adding periodic boundary conditions to the Cogol main lattice. Uh -huh. um, it's this one is so periodic that there are only three different orbits, I guess, in the only three different sites really in this uh, quotiented out cargo, cargo may lattice. So, um, let me see if I can figure out what this one looks like from the Coxeter tiling point of view. I think it's very simple, right? It's just something like, what am I trying to say? Damn, I got, I didn't want that, but I accidentally <laughs> turned on the, 
thing that makes those. Um, sorry, sorry, let's see. Well, yeah, I guess I can do it like that. And um, put a, put a green in the middle and then I'll have blues and reds. Alternating down there. And um, so what would it be? It'd be something like, does it matter where, I, I don't think it matters really where I start the, with the A. Uh, I'll put A there. And then it's supposed to be clockwise rotation around, actually, to get it really right, I should, I, actually it does, it does make a slight difference for my conventions. I think, I think it will work out better parity wise if I, what happened to that red there? Yeah, you never drew that one. Never drew that one. Okay. Sorry, red. I think the parity convention should work out slightly better if I put the, Let's see, green, blue, green. How does that work? Green, blue, red. Green, blue. Okay, yeah, I think if I put A there. So as I rotate around the greens, I'm supposed to go, you know, through the alphabet A, B, C, A, B, C. And then, I mean, I guess I drew more than I needed. Is that right? Why did I draw? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I said that wrong. I said that wrong. Let me let me, let me fix that. I forgot that the fundamental right, the fundamental regions. Oh yeah. Are really supposed to be. Oh yeah. I, I really should just write the parallelograms. <laughs> I think I prefer that. <laughs> uh, yeah. So where is it? It's like there. Sorry. What's going on? There, there, okay, and a green in the middle. And a blue anywhere, let's see. Oh, 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 oh. I guess it works better if I put the reds over here. Right, I'm act this is actually the sort of the official, well, <laughs> this is some version of the children's drawing. These, so these parallelograms are sometimes called lozenges. Um, and this is a, Tiling by lozenges. And um, so now I think it really doesn't matter where I put the letter. I'll call it A there and B and C. And then it's also supposed to be. Is this not working? Let's see. So am I saying something completely paradoxical? I want it to be I thought I wanted it to be the same per are we connected? No, we are. Yeah, I'm having uh, yeah, you mentioned the problems with the internet. So um, I, I, you know, I may have completely, I was having so much trouble here with the triangles or parallelograms. I'm not quite sure how long you missed. How far should I go back? <laughs> Did uh, I, go um, I think I maybe sort of get it, but let's see. So I, in the right hand, well, picture. I, I could say that I'm confused by the picture, but go ahead. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, in the Poncre disc picture. Yes. I think I'm familiar. I hope I'm familiar with the idea of lozenges as these pairs of triangles sharing an edge. Um, right. And in particular, sharing a red green edge so that they, it's the blue that's doubled. Notice in my lozenges there, there's a, you know, there's only one red corner, only one green corner but there are two blue corners opposite each other. So that's the way I've got the lozenges set up. Okay, right. So there are like three possible conventions for lozenges. 
That's right. That's right. Those are three possible sections of the projection from the Coxeter group down to Z mod two. Um, that's okay. right. That's one way of thinking about it. But yes, yes. And so then, um, yeah. Then over in the left hand picture, these, even though the, even though triangles are getting corresponded to triangles in the left hand picture, they're getting corresponded in this weirdo. That's right. That's right. Get switch. So now over on the left, it's like a lozenge would be like two triangles sharing a vertex. A possible lozenge. I mean, well, yeah. And you want it to be sharing a, a vertex of some particular color, blue. Ah, okay. I think I get what was confusing you. I think I get what was confusing. Um, so, right. I mean, I, I want it to be that uh, rotating around any one of the three colors should just be advancing about advancing through the alphabet. Uh huh. And that's actually true. But there's a funny glitch here. So, I mean, you can see you can see I have it set up that going clockwise around the center center green is just going through the alphabet, A, B, C, mm -hmm. going clockwise. And that's supposed to be true for the reds too. So, you, you know, if, if, if you go clockwise from this A, you should hit B, which means that these two opposite edges are being identified. Uh -huh. And if you think about it, that same pattern holds everywhere. So it's, you know, it's the opposite pairs of edges that are being identified, which really just means that we've got, you know, a honeycomb and we're taking the uh, you know we're, we're we're modding out by the translation symmetry of the honeycomb. Am I saying that right? Yeah. Yeah, that's what this periodic boundary condition is. It's modding out by the translation symmetry of the honeycomb. Uh, right? Because I mean if if you're in a in the honeycomb and if you cross through the bottom you come out through the top. Or yeah. if you course through the here, you come out here. Am I saying that right? I think it's true. <laughs> I never thought about that before. So you're saying that's a torus when we do that? I think I may have thought about it once before, but not very much before. And I, when I was working this out yesterday, I, I really, it forced me to really think about it. That um, it's not only true that if you take the opposite sides of a square and, um, identify them that gives you a torus that's famous but it's also true with a hexagon huh. basically because of the honeycomb huh. cool Thanks. that's weird uh so it makes sense that going around the uh rotating around the greens just takes you a b c a b c and also if you check again going around the reds takes you a b c but it really had me confused rotating around the blues, but that's because there are six of these, right? Around a blue, it's like, uh, am I doing this right? Mm. Right, so the thing that counts as a rotation around the blue, it's, right? it's really a reflection if you only rotate once or something like that. So you have to rotate twice. So it's you know, like A, B, C and, um, a B C. So that may look like I cheated, but it's actually very sensible. Um, that oh. you know, a true rotation. Oh. The, the, the true rotations here are one third of a circle. So this, you know, when you rotate it that blue, you actually have to go twice oh. of those half steps. So it's really, it really is true that we're going around any uh, color, <laughs> rotating around any color. Okay. Uh, it just takes you through the through the thing out of you. So so. I think this, this is just supposed to be an example. I think. I mean, it's a very simple example. Actually, actually, to me, this is a very annoying example that kind of confused me because, uh, you know, I realized that this child's drawing, and you mod out by the honeycomb translation symmetry. If you look at it, it's it's kind of clear that it only has one green 
vertex, one blue vertex, and one red vertex. So it's like you started out with the original Riemann sphere, then you took a branch cover, and none of the three points got duplicated, which at first sounded uh, like, you know, paradoxical to me, but it's not paradoxical at all. Are we still connected? See, now I don't know how long we got disconnected. But that's the way it is with the internet connection being done. I am back. Sure, I, but again, once again, you always look like you're absorbed in thought and thinking about the picture. <laughs> I am absorbed in thought, but I'm just not. <laughs> so I, right, I have to remember what I was trying to, what I already said here, uh, not too far back, but what are they trying to say? That um, I was giving you the see, now benefit of the doubt process. since I've known you so long that you're not cheating when you make these right. rotations around the six fold thing, the every other. Right, right. Thing. Um, uh, right. And I was sort of claiming that this one example, I was suggesting that this one example was good enough practice for the general understanding of the uh, abelian children's drawings. So as long as you're not trying to understand them too deeply. See, and now we got really big problems with the connection. You're back. I'm back. I don't know why it's doing this. I don't well, but it's not surprising. You already knew there were problems with it, right? Well, yeah, but it's... Okay, but we'll just we'll just try to yeah try to keep going. So um, that uh, I was hoping that this one example was enough to get the general sense of how a billion child's drawings, in particular, how to convert between the Kagome picture and the Escher Poincaré disc picture. Um, even though we did one special example, can you uh, say yeah. what? curve we get what what we get oh what curve we get um what cover what branch cover we get of this Riemann sphere i think it's i think it's sort of obvious that this must be the eisenstein because it's right it's just taking a, a, a honeycomb and modding out by the translation sym symmetry a regular honeycomb um because you uh -huh. know it's got it's got that symmetry <laughs> So I think it's sort of obvious that this is a um, an Eisenstein elliptic curve. Okay. Uh, but I was commenting that, uh, you know, I'm trying to use this as sort of like the typical example that's gonna teach us how the general example works. But it's, 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 it's also a very highly atypical example <laughs> in ways that annoy me. Um, so I was commenting on the fact that this particular children's drawing only has one green dot in it and only one blue dot and only one red dot. You know, I was prepared for the idea that when you start ramifying, you know, it, it, as you ramify at one point, the other colored dots are going to get duplicated. Um, but this particular example, and there are other examples like this, it manages to actually do a lot of ramification so that there are many sheets but you don't actually duplicate any of the uh, any of the three cardinal points, is it infinity, zero, or one. Um, so that that took me by surprise in a slightly annoying way. But I think it's probably actually just a fun thing to think about. Um, Are these abelian children's drawings always going to give you elliptic curves over? No. Here? No. No. So, like I say, picture the Kagome lattice, picture the unbounded infinite Kagome lattice, okay? Uh -huh. And now pick any periodic boundary conditions you want. So the, you know, the periodic boundary conditions that you, could, that you pick could have a fundamental region that's vaguely parallelogram shaped that um, has a parallelogram that's like a, about the size of a million hexagons or something like that. Uh -huh. And if I remember correctly, that will have a genus <laughs> that's about half a million, if I remember correctly. Um, you know, you can, you, it's very easy to calculate the genus by thinking about the Euler characteristic. And it's like, uh, it, it, 
you end up with, with these a billion children's drawings, you end up with the genus being about twice the number of triangles. Um, but on the other hand, you know, you can have these, you can, you, you can, I think you can get ones with had, like I say, have these very big fundamental regions, but these straight lines sort of spiral around in a straight, they spiral around in a very stripy way so that they, there's really only one, you know, all the lines going through this parallelogram are, are all the green lines going through this big parallelogram are all the same green line. All the blue lines going through it are all the same blue line. All the red lines going through it are the same red line in this Kagome lattice with periodic boundary conditions. And, 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 and so that would correspond to a very high genus, uh, a billion child's drawing, but that only has, still has just these three dots on it. Um, green, one green dot, one blue dot, and one red dot. So that, so they, there must be a lot of, I don't know, how, how, how do you get so many triangles and still just three dots? See, again, I don't know. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm back. I hope that okay. was good, okay. but maybe I'll hear it later. It's also, it's also getting, so we actually quit at regular time, partially on the theory that if the internet connection is so bad that we should, uh, I think we should quit, yeah, because, yeah, this is really bad and won't um, be so bad in the future. Sorry, John, I, I really need to tell you one thing. Hold on just a second. Okay, okay, I'll wait. Bring up here. Yeah, so I'll have to stop. In yeah, minute. yeah, so but let me just, on. you know, let, let me just, just think if there's any, yeah, I think my punchline would be telling you about what I would have talked about if we had more time and better internet connection. So what I would have talked about was these real, children's drawings. So that's gonna be uh -huh. fun, what we start talking about. <laughs> and, uh -huh. okay. well, and, and also talking about the real children's drawings gives you a little bit of a toe in the water for thinking about the action of the absolute Galois group. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, these real things are the things that are fixed under complex conjugation. So you're getting a little bit of information about the action of the absolute Galois group. Uh -huh. So, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. So, you know, we'll have to talk about it when we get uh, better. Uh -huh. <laughs> yep. Okay. okay. So yeah, I got to quit because I'm okay. being told I have to do some stuff as well as the internet connection being lousy. So, sure. Yeah. So, thanks a lot and bye. Oh, okay. Bye.